I'm Seth Potter. I work for the Boeing Company in El Segundo, California at the Satellite Development Center. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is a result from uh, some uh, research and development that actually took place about two years ago. Uh, this is pretty much the same as what I had to say in uh, the 2009 ISDC. Um, and, um, but I'm hoping that uh, a fresh new audience and uh, some new insights will emerge from this. Uh, I want to, before I begin, thank my colleagues, uh, Dean Davis and David McCormick. Uh, Dean Davis, uh, neither one of them is here at this conference. Dean Davis, who is no longer with Boeing, uh, is nevertheless an NSS uh, board member, uh, but unfortunately he was not able to make it. Uh, basically, this is going to be a fairly um, elementary um, presentation uh, by some of the standards we've seen today. Uh, what I want to get into are some of the system design issues um, that um, stand between us and large solar arrays in Earth orbits supplying commercial levels of power. Um, basically, um, those of, I think about, most of you know this, and for those who don't, it'll be something new. For those who do, it'll, it'll give you a tool to answer the question. Now that, that Professor Kaya ha has demonstrated beaming across a room to a rover, and, and, and John has uh, demonstrated beaming to two islands in Hawaii, uh, why don't we take the next step and uh, beam from space and let's just beam enough power to light up a light bulb. Uh, I think a lot of you know why that won't work so easily, or can it? Um, and that's kind of what I want to get into today. Um, system sizes tend to be very large. Um, uh, microwave beams spread out uh, based on the physics of wave mechanics and antennas and that sort of thing. Uh, and the spreading is proportional to the wavelength. Uh, lasers have been suggested. Uh, they tend to be less efficient, but um, we may be able to do something about that. Uh, we can't do much about the nature of wave mechanics itself, but we can do something about the equipment. Bottom line is right now it's hard to build a small solar power satellite. And I'll show you some scaling laws in a minute. Can I have the next slide, please? Um, the, um, and and I'm, I'm very, I should also say, um, let me thank you in advance for all of you who helped me set up, uh, particularly uh, how flattering it is that um, actually um, part of my introduction um, is uh, my position at Boeing is associate technical fellow. Uh, the next step above that is technical fellow, and Boeing has seen fit to fly out a technical fellow who outranks me for the sheer purpose of just flipping my slides. So thank you, Azam. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Oh, and by the way, he's speaking on ISS tomorrow. But anyway, uh, we, despite the, the difficulty of building a small solar power satellite, we want to build a small demo for three reasons. Uh, you all can think of 80 more, but these are, uh, I don't want to lose the audience with too much math, so I'm going to stick to three. One is, of course, demonstrations, meaningful demos with meaningful power density. Uh, the other term, the other is near-term niche markets, and um, Richard Garriott, um, referred to, for example, uh, military bases uh, where the uh, delivery of diesel fuel across the desert is very expensive and dangerous, and of course a growth path to the eventual global markets. Um, so there's a number of reasons we want to build a small solar power beaming system. Uh, let's have the next slide. Uh, now, uh, you might recall if you've read Stephen Hawking that he says that every time you put an equation into a book, and I guess this yeah, goes for... You you, the sale by half. <laughs> yes, and the question is which half. So, all of you whose birthdays are on an odd number day can leave the room. Uh, but um, <laughs> for those of you who uh, either want to stay or lie about when you were born, which at my age is probably most of us, um, is um, I want to direct your attention actually to the upper, to the northwest corner of the screen from your point of view. And what this is is a scaling law. DT is the diameter of the transmitter. DR is the diameter of a receiver sized to fit the nice, fat, juicy part of the beam where most of the energy is. Lambda is wavelength of the beam. And X is the distance between the transmitter and receiver. Um, if those come out to 2.44, you have received about 84% of the energy. And that's that nice fat part of the beam in the middle. There's some energy off in the side lobes as that uh, lower right uh, figure shows, but it's not dense enough to be worth receiving. Uh, and 
therein lies the trade-off. Basically, you, uh, if you want to pick one and let it float, it constrains the other three. Uh, so uh, let's go to the next slide. Okay, now those of you whose birthdays are divisible, not divisible by four, can leave. Uh, this, what basically this says is on the right side of the equation, you see uh, three of the four parameters from the previous slide, and plus you see PT, total power. I naught is the peak, peak beam intensity, and so that's kind of another constraint in that you want that I, I naught, to be not so high that you're going to cook everything in his path. We should have such problems. It's hard to do that. But not so low that it just doesn't pay to build the rectenna. Because one of the economic metrics to a solar power satellite is time average economically receivable power, aerial power density on the ground. If I, if I average is sufficiently low, then why bother? That is, we have radio waves everywhere. Why not just build a, a rectenna? And the answer is because the power density is low. So you want that I to be somewhere on the order of, of let's say, about 20 milliwatts per square centimeter, about 200 watts per square meter, 100 watts per square meter, uh, much higher. And you may have problems with uh, environment, regulations, people get getting nervous, although people get nervous anyway, uh, much lower and it just doesn't pay. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, herein is a uh, example of an intermediate market, which I spoke about in 2009. So those of you who are in Orlando and preferred to hear me than go to Disney World have seen this before. Uh, basically, it's, it's those first two bullets that are I really want to concentrate on, that um, much of the cost in lives and dollars of operating a base, say, in a remote corner of Afghanistan or, or Iraq, is the cost of uh, getting diesel fuel to, say, uh, Andrews Air Force Base or whatever, loading it on a, a C-17 or a C-130, flying it to Afghanistan, putting it on trucks, driving it on a convoy under heavy guard, dodging IEDs and so on, to a forward base. And that's the diesel fuel that's used to power up uh, the, uh, the generators that run the power there. And we did similar studies earlier of uh, you know, delivering JP5 fuel to power the Amundsen-Scott research station in Antarctica. Point is, very expensive to operate these generators in remote locations. Uh, the fully burdened cost of the gas, I call it gasoline, it's really diesel fuel. Um, and JP5, in the case of Amundsen Scott, uh, anywhere between $20 and $400 a gallon. We looked at an intermediate figure of $100 a gallon. So it turns out that um, the uh, we're spending uh, in the equivalent of um, millions or maybe hundreds of million dollars a month on fuel. Um, Let's go to the next slide. Now, what, I, what we did here is we looked into the issue of, is this a near-term market just based on physical constraints? You remember that DR, the receiver diameter, a forward military base may have at most a thousand meter parcel of land to build a rectenna. So the question is, can we fit a beam into that that will have a reasonable amount of power? And so we want to turn the crank on those numbers. Uh, and if you didn't know anything, you, you, you might think back and think, well, with 1,000 meters, on the one hand, uh, is that just not enough room? On the other hand, um, you know, is it so much room that the power is going to be too dilute? Because we all, we, these forward bases use on the order of the single digits to the, the, the tens of megawatts. So figure, I think the nominal figure given in some of the military studies was around five megawatts. So what we did was we turned the crank on the numbers to, to figure out if you have on the order of a couple of hundred meters of land on the other and you need on the order of a couple of megawatts, does the whole power beaming thing from space make sense? And the answer is, well, you already know the answer because you read ahead. Um, yeah. But it depends on frequency and orbit and that sort of thing. So um, let's uh, take a look at some specifics on the next slide. Now, what we have here is if you have a 500-meter uh, uh, rectenna on a military base, 
at reasonable power densities, so happens what you get integrating over that area is uh, 10 megawatts. So it more or less means the numbers work out nicely as far as how much power you get at reasonable power density. But now you've got to work your way up, and once you know dr, uh, the receiver diameter, now you've got to look at the space segment and figure how big is the antenna. Well, if you look at the classic geostationary orbit, and you look at the upper left part of the screen, and you look at frequencies of 2.45 gigahertz, uh, you see that we're talking of, of impractically large um, transmitter diameters. Uh, so you have two choices, um, and you can do one or the other or both. Up the frequency or lower the orbit. And you know what happens when you lower the orbit. You don't get the view times. Um, but nevertheless, there may be architectures where it pays to do that. Uh, let's look at another example. Um, next slide. Uh, somewhat similar. This is a 1,000 meter uh, parcel of land. And you'll notice that the curves jump down slightly. But since this is a log-log graph, they actually jump down quite a bit. Um, and we're now up to 40 megawatts that can fit into that area. But again, uh, if you want to get reasonable um, sizes of the uh, transmitter, let's say on the order of tens of meters, uh, you're talking about either uh, a medium Earth, well, you're really talking about low medium Earth orbit, let's say around 3,000 kilometers or lower, uh, or you're talking about going up to millimeter waves, which is in the the right-hand portion of the graph, or both. And um, now, the problem is once you get to higher wavelengths, then you do have atmospheric issues, um, and uh, I'll get into those in a little bit. Uh, if you go down to a shuttle orbit, which is around 350 kilometers, you may only be in view for about five minutes at a time. You probably all go into those websites. We say, when is the shuttle going to pass over my city? And you got to catch it in that brief period, and you see a little dot going over. Uh, you could probably follow that dot with your eyes for a longer period of time than it is practical to beam, because it's really not practical to, to, to receive a beam that's at a grazing angle at the horizon. So, so those orbits aren't so good, but they may work for demos. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Here we did a, a, a sizing study of a, a, a um, small satellite beaming on the order of a couple of mega, uh, megawatts. And as you can see on, on this side of the graph, and I need to actually walk around and review it myself, we're talking about, and, and the curves depend on frequency, so this curve here is 2.45 gigahertz. We're talking about for 10 uh, megawatts, 150 tons, so we're, we're starting to get into the realm of stuff you can throw in one launch. Now, if you lower the frequency, or I'm saying if you lower the wavelength, raise the frequency, the, um, the antenna, the, the mass is smaller. So why is the mass smaller when you raise the frequency? That's more apparent on the next slide, so let's go to that. And what you see here is this is a, a large range of, of power levels, here zero, I don't know if you can see it back there, all the way up to 10 gigawatts. And this is like the full range of everything that's been considered. And I show this because, first of all, it, it, you see how things scale up to commercial levels of power. But second of all, it, it makes a point in a kind of a system level point of view of, of why you can't, why it's not feasible to build a solar power satellite. What this is on, this, on the vertical axis here, is the mass of a satellite as a function of a power level with frequency as the, as the parameter that, that's varied. So let's look at the 2.45 gigahertz curve, partly because that's been widely studied, partly because it's probably easier to see from the back of the room. And this was also true of the room we had in Orlando. So we come a little bit north and nothing much changes. So anyway, what happens here is in this part of the curve, and if you want more power, you're going up to small demo level, to up, 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 up to commercial levels of power. It's kind of obvious that the satellite's going to get heavier because you need more solar array to get more power. So if you want to build a little one, let's go this way and go small. And now let's get real small. Did somebody copyright that line? Um, anyway, uh, it, it turns out that if you're going to get too small, the mass actually gets up because you need a larger antenna to focus the energy to economically recoverable power densities. 
So at this end of the curve, the mass is driven by the solar array. At this end of the curve, the mass is driven by the size of the antenna. There is a point at which it bottoms out. This bottom point is the, the, the mass of the, the minimum mass of the solar power satellite. And so you can see the problem with building a satellite to light up a bulb. If you want to build a satellite, I'll be ridiculous, to, to transmit one kilowatt, you're way over in this part of the curve. So you're actually pretty massive because you need a big antenna to focus the energy. Now, you can see from the family of curves what you can do. If you raise the frequency, the wavelength gets smaller and everything scales down. So this trough in the curve slowly moves this way. So this makes the point that, and this is for geo orbits. The whole thing kind of shifts downward for lower orbits. But you, you should see the point that is, if you want to build a small solar power satellite, you have to go up in frequency, down in wavelength, because that's where the bottom of this curve moves. Now, the actual shape of this will change in time as, as we come out with, let's say, lighter solar arrays versus lighter antenna structural elements, which will win in the future, will, will shift where the, the trough in the curve is. But I, I make this point, and, and my colleague Dave McCormick was, was very good at modeling this based on inputs Dean and I gave him. It just makes the point that there does exist this bottom and if you go either higher or lower power levels, the whole thing gets heavier. So let's go to the next slide. I want to start to get into how can you build a small solar power satellite. And since uh, I've only used about half my time, if the answer was, well, you can't, you can all leave and go to somebody else's session, we'd be over. But I'm an optimist, and I'm going to point out three ways we can do it based on the equations that I showed earlier. And I noticed not only did nobody leave the room, people actually came in. So maybe like the space geek paradox is every equation you put in will actually increase your audience by about 10%. Uh, but I don't have any more equations, so this is, this is it, folks. Um, basically, there's, there's three things you can do. Decrease the wavelength, lower the orbit, or leave the heavier components on the ground. I didn't get into structural mass, but I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. And uh, well, I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll tell you how the story ends um, to whet your appetite. Um, Dr. Komaratha uh, in this morning session kind of told you where I'm going with this, but I want to tell it to you again in context. Uh, let's go to the first method on the next slide, which is um, decrease the wavelength. Um, the disadvantage is, our um, power transmission efficiency may decrease and weather outages may increase because atmospheric absorption tends to get worse at shorter wavelengths, though there are windows. You may remember Professor Kaya showing a, a graph of atmospheric absorption. You saw it went up and down, up and down. Maybe if we can aim for one of those dips, we might get lucky. Now, so let's go to the next slide and um, I'll, uh, I'll show you some specifics. Um, it so happens, 5.8 gigahertz has also been studied, and it's still in that lower range of microwaves where the atmosphere is still relatively transparent. Uh, 94 gigahertz happens to be the location um, of one of those little troughs in Professor Kaya's graph of atmosphere absorption. So we picked that as part of our study, and the question is, uh, can you use that? And the reason. And one of the reasons we were motivated by the desire to do a demo from the International Space Station. So we we're trying to make the case for that. And so we were studying how much power do you, would we send to such a demo and um, where would we be, uh, build the receiver. So we studied um, two locations. One is uh, Goldstone, California, which is in the high desert, uh, dry air, 90, 970 meter altitude there already exists the Goldstone receiving station with a 70-meter dish. Uh, Florida, we studied, uh, I believe there was a, an Air Force base there that was kind of our nominal location for the study. Tends to be more cloudy, more humid. You're at sea level. Uh, receiving diameter, uh, we assumed 70 meters, but there is not currently such a station there. But we assumed it for consistency. Uh, Air sea level? Yes, I would say so. 
uh, and I would say, uh, in fact, there there have been some studies uh, of of Arecibo. Uh, we studied it. Um, it's um, it's it's not a bad option. I think it's actually probably a better option. But um, we Goldstone was a strong possibility, so we were just doing we were making as much apples to apples as we we could. Yes. Does that interfere with its radio astronomy or not? I think if one of the, well, there's two problems. One is we'd have to get actually buy time on the 70 meter dish. Second is, would beaming to it interfere with the other antennas? I, I don't know. I think it might. So I think that might be an issue. That's a good point. Uh, EMI is always an issue with these things. Uh, I don't cover it here, but it's a good point. Uh, let's uh, go to the next one. Uh, next slide. Uh, in this comparison here, Here's 5.8 gigahertz. The blue is Goldstone. Think of blue sky, I don't know. Uh, blue state, red state? No. Um, <laughs> and basically, what we have is if you transmit, um, if you transmit, uh, I don't remember how much we I guess we're transmitting uh, 30 kilowatts based on how much power we can optimistically siphon off from ISS. I'm thinking that's a little high. 10 kilowatts. Oh, was it? Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, but uh, I don't know why I thought 30. Uh, one of my other graphs was 30. 10 might still be optimistic, but let's see what happens with 10. And if we can only get 5, it all scales proportionately. Uh, basically, uh, at the sizes of antennas and transmitters we were using uh, that we could reasonably get onto ISS, uh, what where the beam is going to be much wider than the receiver. Since it's only a demo, we don't have to receive the entire beam. So basically, uh, at uh, so you see across the bottom, 5, 10, and 30 meter uh, transmitting antennas. Uh, and uh, 5 is like maybe like what you get on TGOS or something, I guess. Uh, and uh, you can see that as you build, since, since you're well within the fat part of the beam, as you build it, a a bigger transmitting antenna, you're focusing the fat part narrower, so the 70 meter receiver will scoop up proportionally more of it. No controversy there. You also see that Goldstone versus Florida at 5.8 gigahertz is virtually the same. Goldstone is barely perceptibly more. If you look at 94 gigahertz, therein lies the difference. Uh, you see that um, in, in Florida you get a little over half of what you do at Goldstone. And the reason there is twofold. Uh, one is 94, the clear air atmospheric attenuation, I believe is around 18%. Not a big deal, uh, but it has its effect. The other thing is we did take into account humidity, and there lies where you take a big hit. Um, and so uh, the answer is, can we use 94 gigahertz? And the answer is maybe it's location dependent. I think we can use it for certain locations. For a demo, we certainly could. Again, it's, you could say it's a 3 dB loss. The problem I have with expressing things in dB is it's, uh, it tends to compress the scale. So for communications, like 3 dB loss might be, you know, you might have your high 3 dB frequency, your low 3 dB frequency, look at, you know, spectra in terms of that. Problem is with power delivery, power is money. You transmit power, you bill somebody for it. So 3D would be loss of money. I mean, I think if your boss cut your paycheck by 3 dB, you'd be pretty upset. So, but for the purposes of demo, we can live with it. Yes. Can I ask a quick question? Can you comment on the on the mass of the transmitter for 10 kilowatt uh, between 5.8 gigahertz and 94 gigahertz? Is the 94 gigahertz conversion a lot less efficient? Uh, they're not. Yes, uh, we didn't take that into account. That is. We, we made the naive assumption that you were basically putting that much power into the antenna. Um, and there is a, the other problem is, of course, a, uh, a, I guess like a klystron or something that you use for 5.8 is going to be very efficient. Uh, equipment for, I guess, there are solid state devices you can use for 94, not as efficient. And there in the bottleneck is you got a certain power budget, a certain amount of power that they will give you at ISS and no more. Uh, I think when you fold that in, so I, I think, you know, so this is an apples to peaches comparison. It's not apples to alligators, it, it's still fair. Uh, I, so I, I would draw from this that 94 gigahertz is fine for demos. If 
may even work for commercial power beaming in certain locations. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Uh, we'll go on to the next uh, way of lowering the scale, lower the orbit, and, um, the, uh, and therein lies the question of dwell time. It is continuous in geo and nowhere else. So let's go to the next slide, and I'll get into some specifics. Um, this is an example of if you can't have continuous, what's the next best thing? And we looked into sun synchronous, and I think uh, Dr. Komarath uh, did discuss that this morning. Um, and there's uh, the nice part about that is if you basically sun synchronous, as you may know, is the plane of the orbit maintains the same orientation toward the sun. <coughs> it does that by making use of certain gravitational perturbations from the Earth's equatorial bulge. So that plane, te it tends to be, for low orbits, almost polar. Why? It's just the way the physics of the shape of the Earth work out. Uh, and now, that's a good thing, because the, the Earth observation satellites that use sun-synchronous orbits, they want to come over each orbit at the same local time to get the same angle of the sun for, for, for fair comparison of, of different parts of the Earth's surface. Um, and so if you, if you want to photograph the whole Earth, it's a good orbit because as you make your way around the Earth, the Earth will orbit beneath you and eventually you'll paint the whole surface. Nice thing also about synchronous orbits is if the plane happens, if you happen to orient that plane around the, the day-night terminator, you will be in sunlight most of the time. That's what you want if you have solar collectors. So you have preserved one of the two features of geo, being in sunlight most of the time. You've kind of lost the other one, um, and which is continuous access to the ground station. But First of all, for a demo, you may not need that. Second of all, uh, and I believe one of the presentations today touched on this. Um, I'm trying to remember who, which one, uh, because I want to give the person credit. I think Professor Kaya, maybe you touched on this. Um, but anyway, um, if you have a constellation of satellites with hand, beam handoffs, you may be able to have, if not continuous power, at least a high transmission duty cycle as each ground station acquires a new satellite and then each satellite acquires a new ground station spaced uh, along a certain ground track. Now, there's another little trick you can do. In the, if you choose your altitude correctly, it, it forces a certain period, which if you plan it just right, will, be, uh, will give you a daily repeating ground track so you'll reacquire the same ground stations at more or less the same time every day. Uh, so you have preserved one of the features of geo, continuous access to the sun, and you've partially preserved the other that is repeatable, if not continuous access to the ground station. Uh, and so uh, let me, uh, let's go to the next slide, and I'll, I'll show you some specifics of this. Um, this is um, a graph of the relationship between altitude and inclination for a uh, sun-synchronous orbit. And so what you have here is, for a typical sun-synchronous orbit, inclinations are slightly off-polar, which, again, might be a good thing. Um, and specifically, between about 1,400 and 3,300 kilometers, you will always be in sunlight. And uh, if we go to the next slide, I'll show you why. And here's a bunch of different sun-synchronous orbit. Here's a little low one right around the terminator. And it's uh, a little bit off polar. And then as you go higher, um, you're going to be a little more off polar. So what happens is, if you get real low, you're going to dip into the Earth's shadow. As you get higher, you must increase your inclination beyond polar. And this top part of the orbit will dip into the Earth's shadow during certain parts of the year. And I showed, I showed this at the northern hemisphere winter solstice, which is kind of a, a stressing case. Everything is nice at the equinoxes, which is actually when, when geo is bad because you get an eclipse at night. But uh, between about, again, between about uh, 1,400 and 3,300 kilometers, you will always be in sunlight. And in one of my AIAA presentations, I pointed out that within there, there's, I believe, three repeating ground tracks, three altitudes that give you repeating ground tracks. So 
you know, we felt that those, that range of sun synchronous orbits is worthy of further study. Uh, let's go to the next slide. And here I'm going to touch upon some things that were, that uh, Dr. Komaratha hinted at earlier. Uh, as an intermediate goal, since much of the mass of a solar power satellite is the transmitting antenna, and in the case of um, photovoltaic arrays, the power management and transmission apparatus, uh, we can, as a short-term goal, let's leave something out. That is, let's start with just simple reflectors, which is, you know, you may have, I don't know, say half of the utility at one-tenth mass. So let's go to the next slide. and. Uh, I'll show you the, the, uh, the simple idea of just bouncing sunlight onto an array at night. Maybe sort of architecturally the simplest thing to do. Uh, the sun's already there. Let's just extend the time at which the sun is available. Challenge there is that for a reflector, uh, you're limited by the half degree uh, divergence of the sun's image. So what you're doing is you're projecting a little image of the sun on the Earth. That image will be the, will scale with the altitude of the satellite, regardless of the size of the reflector. The size of the reflector only controls the brightness of that spot, but there's nothing you can do about the size of the spot. People have suggested why not parabolic shapes, uh, but the problem there is you figure out the uh, you have a par parabolic shape in geostationary orbit, focusing sunlight on the ground. You have a, a mirror with a focal length of 36,000 kilometers. The, that image is not going to shrink up a whole lot. So you're basically more or less stuck with the size of, of the spot. But again, you can lower the orbit, settle for a shorter duty cycle, and everything scales accordingly. And you may, I believe Richard Garriott might have alluded to this, might be able, oh no, it was Owen, who was his father, uh, might be able to illuminate a city at night, for example. Uh, or illuminate a terrestrial array that is all designed to receive power during the day and extend its usefulness into the night. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, and uh, the other way of uh, leaving heavier components on the ground is through power relay. So let's look at the next one. And uh, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, the idea is you build uh, two solar arrays, let's say one in California, one in Australia, and uh, at most times, either one or the other will be in sunlight. If you oversize each one to power a laser, bounce the laser off a reflecting satellite to the other one, and therefore each one can be used continuously. Again, a very lightweight uh, concept, uh, you put it in geo, use of a laser on the ground means you don't have to launch the weight of the power transmitter, um, you, you're launching only this reflector, and this is sort of an intermediate waypoint be uh, between uh, terrestrial solar and space solar. The main disadvantage there is, of course, everything, the ground-based array must in theoretically double in size to power the other array, actually a lot more than that because lasers are not particularly efficient. So one of the problems of this is, of course, that it doesn't quite do what we hope space solar power does, that is, that is improve the time hours power density on the ground. But on the other hand, it does do that to some extent because an array on the other side of the world that would be sitting unused half of the time is now receiving power when it otherwise would not. Uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and um, I probably just said what that was. I think some of these are out of order, so let's go to the next one. Um, and uh, so basically, um, you know, we looked at system architecture. Um, again, uh, size is determined, size of a reflector is determined by altitude. Higher, higher means larger. Um, so for a geo reflector, the image of the sun is going to be 330, 340 kilometers. Uh, for a, so basically, rule of thumb, take the altitude and, uh, you know, divide it by 100. And uh, so 30, 36,000 kilometers becomes 360, not quite, it's more like 340, but three, 1,000 kilometers becomes a 10 kilometer spot, which of course is moving. But so therein lies the trade-off. Um, geo, simplest architecture, but large satellite. 
uh, very low orbit, small reflected image, but you need an awful lot of reflectors. Uh, somewhat higher LEO, uh, like the sun synchronous, may be an effective compromise. So the system study there is you look at, instead of beam handoffs in this case, it's reflected image handoffs. Uh, and the, so what you want to do is you look at the total mass of the many reflectors you need, what duty cycle you think you can get depending on where your arrays are on the ground, uh, and turn the crank on how many of them you need, what percentage of time you're, they're in use, how much they weigh, and compare different altitudes. We didn't have time to do that. I'm just sort of setting up to what the system study needs to be. A uh, couple of ancillary factors there, of course, is if you're in really low orbit and the image is clipping along at a really good pace, you've got to flip that thing around. Uh, the Russians actually flew something called Znamia 2.0, where they, they had a fixed image of the sun whooshing its way along the ground at five clicks a second, and people on mountaintops actually were able to see this thing going over the clouds. Um, I think the astronauts were able to see it, um, and uh, it, it happened to be cloudy in Europe when they flew this thing. Uh, they planned a, a second demo called Znamia 2.5. I think the first one was 20 meters in diameter. The second one was 25 meters in diameter. Um, and um, from, a, from a low orbit, you get an image of the sun a couple of kilometers across, going at a couple of kilometers a second. So you'll have on the order of one second where you're illuminated. But Znamia 2.5 would have steered. Gets a little harder where something, instead of 25 meters, something 1,000 meters is steering. Uh, and um, we'll build solar power satellites for food, so pay us and we'll look into it. Um, let's go to the next slide. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was something appropriate to wash it down with. Um, I, I did, after all, go to graduate school, and I did need the four basic food groups, um, one of which is caffeine. Um, basically, here uh, w we did some very cursory uh, system studies. Uh, again, here's the, um, the, uh, a reflector in a sun-synchronous orbit. Uh, we played around with some gravity gradients, stabilized ideas. Next slide shows a kind of a, a, a double reflector concept. Uh, we didn't, and this, this is probably more practical because you have one mirror slowly tracking the sun, and in, in sun synchronous, it doesn't have to do a lot. This, a smaller secondary mirror tracking the Earth. Uh, so in the long run, that might be more practical. Next slide, uh, geo-architecture, a lot simpler. Uh, here's a perpendicular or orbital plane concept, which basically uh, gives you power in the middle of the night when you, when a solar array normally would not be getting any. Uh, doesn't give you much the other times. But again, in terms of how much time average power you get per mass delivered in space, might pay to do something like this. Uh, next slide. Uh, and uh, if I were honest, this would be my last slide, actually. It kind of is, although I have some backups. So the idea is uh, near-term solar space solar power technology can do a couple of things. It can provide risk burn down for a large uh, solar power satellite further down the road, and it can maybe provide actual usable power uh, in the case of um, the um, military bases. With the right choice of orbit, beam transmission frequency, uh, system architecture, and I don't think I use the term but here, but niche market, it may pay to do so in the long run because the idea being, the common argument uh, we often get is space solar power is going to be X times more expensive than coal, oil, nuclear, terrestrial solar, or whatever, uh, and therefore uh, it doesn't pay. Uh, well. And we're all working hard on making it more competitive. Um, the uh, price of some of the other commodities will probably increase with time. Um, and as launch costs come down, space solar will be more competitive. But in the short run, the idea here is uh, rather than try to, rather than only try to lower the cost, of course we do want to do that, in the near term, let's look at and I often hear figures bandied about of 
hundred or two hundred times. There's probably someone at this conference will claim it's a thousand or two. Uh, sounds a little high, um, but um, suppose it's a hundred times more expensive than diesel generators. Well, why not find a niche market um, where a hundred times conventional power would actually pay? That is the military basis. The other uh, area where beamed power uh, will be competitive even at very high costs. Let me guess, the arc. Um, Actually, we did study that. Yeah. It does. Yeah. But uh, the, uh, the one I was thinking of was in space itself. And if you want to know about that, you have to come to my presentation tomorrow morning. Okay. So that's, a, that's all I have. And I'm, I, I thank you for all those of all of you who gave me assistance in setting up and for coming. And uh, uh, John, I think we have a few minutes for questions, about a quarter or two. Uh, in the back? Oh, oh Jeff, yes. yes. Uh, I have two questions related, specific and then more general. Uh, I think you showed that the Soviet Union was very well equipped to Uh, yes, the time element's the same. Uh, it's uh, this is a good setup for uh, a, uh, mentioning that, of course, megawatts already has uh, time factored in, in that it's uh, it's it is a watt or a megawatt is a rate. So so when I say five megawatts, I'm assuming like time average equivalent power continuous, uh, and so basically. What I'm looking at is if a base uses five megawatts continuously, 24-7, what do we have to do to get that five megawatts in there? Well, there's a couple of things we can do. We can truck in enough diesel fuel to crank that out, or we can, we can cut that in half and beam power in the other half, or we can cut it out and completely beam power in continuously. So some intermediate state where you have a fleet of satellites delivering power, say, 20% of the time, uh, but if it's depending on the exact numbers, that 20% might displace 20% of the diesel fuel, or 40%, or 60%, uh, depending on the power density you are you are able to practically get. Uh, that well, let's see. That would scale uh, by the duty cycle. So basically, if the satellite, if you have five megawatts continuous, and you want to send it in one burst, and that burst is the equivalent of one one hundredth of a day, say fifteen minutes, which is about a, a low medium. It's a medium Earth orbit view time is about fifteen minutes. So that's about one one hundredth of a day. If you want to send that five megawatts in there in that burst then you're transmitting 500 megawatts during those 15 minutes. So now that's a big satellite. That's almost a commercial level of satellite. So in order to make that pay, that satellite is going to have to have something else to do. The other 99% the, the other of the time, it's not over that base. So the scenario you're asking about, that's the trade-off. That is, it can be done, but now you're talking about a, a investing in a 500 megawatt satellite to deliver 5 megawatts to the base. Um, I think that would have to be a, a, a study, not a big one, so I'll do it if you pay me, but um, I, that would be a kind of a short turnaround study that probably done in a couple of days or a couple of weeks, uh, or Say, let's say uh, everyone who was in this session, in John's session today, for one day uninterrupted. But basically, the answer is, you. I think the answer is, uh, the answer is really kind of a system architecture question. That is, if, if you have, I, I'm guessing somewhere on the order of 20%, but I just sort of pulled that out of space. Uh, that is, you have a fleet of satellites giving these bursts of power that add up to a 20% duty cycle. But it, I think it would only pay if those satellites had something else to do the other 80% of the time. Because what you're doing is 
you may only, your, your base may see the satellite only 20% of the time. That may be enough to get your burst, but your satellite doesn't care that it's only on duty 20% of the time. It is still built to the capability of beaming 500 or 50 megawatts continuously. It's probably not going to pay unless you have somewhere else to beam during the other time. So that my earlier point, I think, your, your, your system architecture, where you're going with this, I think, makes sense. But it would have to be kind of an architecture study of how much time not only can you beam, but can you use the satellite. I saw the hand uh, in the back go up. Yeah, that's a Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Marianne, I saw you raise your hand. Um, yeah, I think I think the uh, the the nineteen seventy studies I think we're talking about ten or twenty year lifetimes. Uh, the, uh, the, the the arrays on the space station have been up there ten years and they've seen almost zero degradation. Yeah, so I, I'm actually optimistic about how long these things would last. I think for something really big, really low, you have to you know you have atmospheric attenuation. There might be some kind of effects that I don't understand of being that low uh, for that long a time. But, but I, I'm, I'm generally optimistic that, that you do have enough time to pay back the investment of launching and constructing it. Now, paying back the energy is another story. That is, is almost trivial. At least the calculations I did. John, correct me if I'm wrong. I actually got results on the order of days. Um, yeah, days to weeks. I, I got. I actually got days. Uh, I, I actually got, in some cases, hours. But I don't trust those results. It 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 is it is trivial compared to the life of, of a satellite. Um, so I think your point is well taken. I, I think it, it will eventually pay itself back. Uh, I think the young lady, uh, uh, Claire, is that you? Yeah. One, uh, one last. Question. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm afraid that this may be a very naive question, but is it not possible to reflect? Microwaves. I mean, if you do, is it that it takes a very large reflector? But could it be mesh? I mean, how does this work? Uh, the answer is actually that's an excellent question. Um, I think John, we, that's going to be have to be the last one. Uh, but the answer is yes. Um, there, you can, you can, you may be able to relay power by means of microwaves. Um, you might be able to, uh, in low orbit, capture sunlight on one satellite microwave it to a, or laser it to another and then either reflect or retransmit it to the ground. Yeah, it can be done. Things will scale up somewhat larger. One of the advantages if, for example, a, a, you might have a compromised wavelength of, let's say, 35 megahertz, gigahertz or, or 94 gigahertz, some frequency of very short microwaves that would not make it through the atmosphere that well, but if you're using it, for example, space-to-space -space relays, you don't have to. So the answer is, uh, it would dive, things would scale up bigger than with lasers, but yeah, you could do that. Uh, I think that's all the time we have, so thanks, John.